Good evening. This week is Parshas Mishpotim, and we are going to enter into Chodesh Odor uh, in just another few days. The rule, as the Shulchan Aruch says, is Mishenichnes Odor Marbim Besimcha. And the Arizal says, interestingly, that the Gemara says, Leka Mitz, Leka, Mitz, Leka Schar Mitzvah Bahay Alma, Leka Bahay Alma Schar Mitzvah, <laughs> which means that if you took all the billions in the world and gave a person for a mitzvah that he did, it doesn't fully pay him because the schus of the mitzvah is so great that the whole olam hazeh could not pay him for the one mitzvah. But the Arizal says, even though that we cannot be paid for the mitzvahs in this world, but we can be paid for the simcha of our mitzvah. That when a yid does a mitzvah and he feels that there is a tremendous nachas ruach tarkodesh baruch Hu, and therefore he feels very happy and very f filled with with a gladness because of the fact that the mitzvah was done and the fact that hakadosh baruch Hu was happy. So th for that. Simcha, says the Arizal, you could get an olam hazeh schar for that simcha shel mitzvah. Now, there is a taich, mishenich nesodah, that when there's so much negativity out there, that how can we dilute and dissolve all of that atzvus and all of that uh, lack of positivity. The way is marbim besimcha that mishenichnas odor that when you want to take away the, the tsar, so work on the Indian of simcha and that can bring all the bracha down. Now we know that there's a rule that if there's something, let's say in Kashrus, a problem, so there's such a halacha as bottled b'shishim. That means if a drop of milk, chas fell into a big pot of chicken soup, so the halacha is one drop, there's more than 60 times the drop in the chicken soup, it's bottle. And you don't have to throw away the whole pot of soup and you don't, it's bottle b'shishim. Now, with the two months when we have a year like our year now, that you have two months of odor, so there's 60 days so Tzadikim used to say that it's bottled b'shishim because of the simcha of Adar, that the problems of the world are, because there are 60 days. Now somebody once asked on it, but the first day of Rosh Chodesh Adar is still Shvat. So you don't have 60 days of order, you have just 59. But they answered and said that since it's called Rosh Chodesh order, even though it's the last day of Shvat, but it is Rosh Chodesh, and we are already saying Hallel, and we're already saying Musaf, and we're laying the Kriya of Tzavis B'nai Yisrael via Marta Aleim is Korboni Lachmi, Le'ishai, so it is enough under the umbrella of other to be part of the 60 and it isn't 
59. We're not short in the Cheshbon. There's so much difficulty out there, each and every family, one for children and one for Tsaurus with children and one for Parnassa. And there's such a variety of difficulties that let's hope that Chodesh Oder Habo Aleinu Letoiva, and there's a double dose of Oder, that everything should be bottle mavutl ki afra diara. Now, interestingly, the Orachayim HaKadosh says on the Pasuk Im Kesef Talve Esami, we have in this week's Parsha, that if a person, when a person lends, Rashi says, that this is one of the few places in the Torah that the word Im does not mean if, but it means Ka'asher, when you will lend someone money, lo siya lo kenosha. Do not be oppressive. That means, let's say the due date came. And technically, it's the due date. He should pay you back. But let's say the man doesn't have the money. And you really don't need the money that day. If it came a week later, you're still surviving and you're still fine. So there's a, a, a iser diarisa of oppressing him for the money. Where's the money? I mean, we made up this and this date. Where is it? So the Orachayim HaKadosh says that the word noisha, which usually means oppressive, it means nosi. Look in the Orachayim HaKadosh in this parsha. And he says, because when a person lends someone money, if he's not refined in his midos and in his edelkeit, it can go a little bit to his head, and if not to the head, at least in his actions. That means when he sees the person, he feels like he has a hand over him. Yeah, he lent the money, and uh, so the Ur Chaim Akodosh teaches the word noisha to mean odon, like a nosi, like the, the president, the prince, over the other person, that the person should get a feeling of discomfort in how the person is treating him or even looking at him, because when someone borrows money, he becomes very sensitive to the fact that he had to borrow and the fact that this is the person that he's indebted to. So, so, the Orachim HaKadosh says, he asks Akasha in general, why is it that one person is wealthy and one person doesn't have enough money? And he goes into a few answers. One is Gilgulim, that it could be in a prior life that this person owed money to the other one. And now he, the situation turned the opposite. He had to borrow from him and he had to come back down because of his treatment of the person. So he explains and says that really when a person gets rich or has, excuse me, money, the other person really... It's his money. And mina shamaya, but there's a reason that he has to suffer. And there is, why is he short on money? Why does he have to ask someone to lend him? All of this. This is a cheshbon that the person has to go through this tsar. Because of a prior lifetime, so says the Orachayim HaKadosh. And 
that really the money that the Gevir has is the money of the, uh, the Oni. But the Oni has to go to him to get it because of some reason that no one knows that he has to live through the pain of going to ask the other person. But because it, un, it belongs to the Oni, he explains the Pasuk, Im kesef tal ve'esami, es he'oni imoch. The Oni which is with you. What, what are those words? Es he'oni imoch. I'm, isn't it extra? Obviously, somebody's coming over to a gavir or to somebody for money. We know that he is amongst the Klal, amongst the Yidden, and that's why he's coming over to get the money. So he teaches the Yorachim HaKadosh as Ha'oni, because this Oni, Imach, is with you that your money that you're holding is really Imach, is his, and that you have to come over to ask him. So the point being that when a person, lo aleinu, lo aleichem, has to go to borrow money, the person lending should not look at him like he's some sort of, like the Arachim HaKadosh says, balabas, or his lord, or his adon, or his... Because he should know that there's a chedvin lemala. Why specifically this man is coming specifically over to you? And I've said in the past that when it comes to tzedakah, says the Arizal, that if someone comes over to you and asks you for tzedakah, even a dollar or a quarter, it's a simon that you once turned them down in a prior life or a many years before, and he's here to be misakin, that you should give him something to be able to exist. Now, our parsha begins with the Evid Ivri. I mean, the Mephorshim, the Srasemes, they all talk about the idea that we're coming out of Yisro, Matan Torah, Aseris Adibris, and then we come into a parsha of every every. And the end of Mishpatim, if you take a look at the Sedra we're going to lay in this Shabbos, the last chunk of the parsha goes back to Matan Torah, like <clears throat> when the Yidden said Nasa Nishma, It wasn't in last week's parsha, it's in this week's parsha. We're back into Matan Torah. So, they, a few of them say basically the same thing, that it's like a sandwich, that Yisro began with Matan Torah, and the end of our Sedra ends with Matan Torah, and in between are all the halachos of Ben Odom Lachavero. Because let's not forget, we are living in Olam Hazeh. We are not living in Olam Haba. We're striving that our Machshavar, Adibar, and our Misa should fit in to the place in Shemayim where our Machshavar, Adibar, and Misa are going to. And it should fit in with beauty, with elegance, with with articulation, with so many aspects that make it fit in to Olam ha, ha, Haba, and that we have the benefit from it. But it's all Tolui. For instance, if a person sits and he has machshava about tefillin, but he doesn't put on the tefillin, he's not, it doesn't get the mitzvah. Because the mitzvah is in this world and the oilam hamaisa. And we have to do the mitzvah to get the perfection of what it's meant to be. 
for Olam Haba. But all of our parsha is probably the most, I don't want to use the word mundane, because every letter is Kodesh Kedoshim, it's the Torah, it's mitzvahs. But the simplest of mitzvahs, which you would think, and that's why it says, that sandwiched in between Yisro and the end of our parsha is, <coughs> excuse me, all of the, <coughs> all of the mitzvahs and evidivri is the first thing. Now, not everyone because an, becomes an evid, and not everyone is an odon for an evid. So why would this be the tuna fish be in the sandwich? That means the, Yisro is the piece of bread on the top. The end of our parsha is the second piece of it. And in between are mitzvahs that are very about the, an animal and about, the, about an evid, every the simpler. And they all say the same nekuda. Because to perfect our achievements... In Olam Hazeh, you have to work on yourself to deal with the simplest situation in the most spiritual, courteous, positive manner. So even the first example given right after Matan Torah is Evid Ivri. And that's like the simplest of the simplest. And it says that the reason that the Balabas, who is the Adon, and has this Evid Ivri, that if the Evid Ivri wants to stay be, beyond the six years, and he goes out, Va'avodo Liolam, when there's Yoivel. Now, Yoivel could be two years later, and Yoivel could be 30 years later. It's every 50 years. But if it comes, Yoival, and he wants to stay as an Evid because he heard on Har Sinai that he should be an Evid to HaKodesh Baruch Hu, not to a human being, the reason that the Balabas is the one that puts the... the um, uh, Verotza Adonov es asno ba marzea va'avodo liolam. Liolam meaning yoivel. But Verotza Adonov es asno, that why does he specifically have to do it? So says the Svasem is taka because he made it so comfortable to such a point that here he doesn't have. The children are not his. If he had children while he was an Evid, they go to the Odom. And the wife remains there like a shifcha. So he doesn't even really have anything for himself. Yet he wants to stay. You, the Balabas, made it too comfortable for him. In other words, we're supposed to make and Evid comfortable. If there's only one pillow, the Odon has to give it to the Evid. And if there's only that day certain food, some food, it has to go to the Evid. He's busy working a whole day. So the Evid, the Gemara and the Torah provides for very graciously that even under the umbrella of being a servant, he has so many rights and he has so much positive treatment, which is the way it should be. But there has to be an atmosphere that the Odon provides the Evid to understand the difference between being a free man and having your own wife and having your own children versus your day's work Zero belongs to you. And that's why he has to be the one, not the Besden. They do it in Besden. But he has to be the one to Verotza Adonov es Osno Bamartseya. Now, the 
There is a Pusik in our Sedra Lo Sikach Shochad. It's also in Shoiftim in Bamid in Devorim. And right in the same Pasuk, it says, Vigercholo Silchots. And someone becomes a ger. Don't look down at him like he's some third rate yid. Lo Silchots, you should not oppress. And oppress doesn't mean hitting him, but it means even making a comment that he could feel terrible from. That's called Lo Silchots, not to pressure. But the Mephorshim are curious why in one Pusik would be lo sikach shochad and vigercha, because when you have a vav, it connects to whatever was before. So this lo sikach shochad continues that concept into vigercha. <clears throat> Lo Silchatz. And what is the Shaykhist, the Mefarshim mask? Because what is Shochad? You know, when we think of Shochad, we think right away of a judge taking money, a bribe, to slant his deci- decision making. Means if he's a judge, he has a background of halacha how the man should be guilty or how he should be innocent. He has a storage of knowledge that help him provide an erlich of fine psak to adjudicate a decision. But if foreign influence comes in, then it taints the thinking of the person. Foreign influence doesn't just mean you take a hundred dollar bill and you put it in the judge's pocket. Foreign influence could mean that his best friend's cousin is the one in the Besden now. And the mere fact that it's the cousin of such a good friend, he's being tainted. That's foreign influence. An extenuating reason why you would feel differently about the person standing in front of you. So the Pusik tells us, Veger Lo Silchotz, that just like by Lo Sikach Shochad, stay straight, and your thinking should be straight. And don't let in all of this foreign influence. So too, when you deal with this gear. Don't come in with your biases and your foreign thinking. Look at this gear, if he's a gear emes. I mean, the Arizal says that if someone becomes a gear, it's a simon that at one point he was a yid. That means an erlich reason. That means some people become gerim because they want to marry someone that's, that's, that passes up the gerus. It has to be L'Shem Shemayim. And he has to know the halachas. And he has to become a from Yid. And he has to do all of these things that would re-establish and, and underscore his commitment to Yiddishkeit. But we always have certain biases. Like I said last week, if someone walks into Shul with a little yarmulke, most people in the show would look at him like some second. You never spoke to the person. You never met the person. He may be the nicest, Balchesed, the nicest person that's learning six hours a day, but he's not wearing the same black hat that you're wearing. You are, that's called foreign influence. And that's why in one Pasuk, the Lo Sikach Shochad and the Vigercha Lo Silchotz. Now, in our Sedra, we have the Parsha of Dayonim. Dayonim means 
And the Pasuk says, Achir Rabim Lahatos, that you have to go with majority. I remember in Detroit as a little boy, I was just bar mitzvah, and there was an issue of the yeshiva, which was a kosher, erlich, a wonderful yeshiva called Beis Yehuda. And they were struggling with money, something fierce. And in the city, there was a group called the United Hebrew School System. And they had under their umbrella all the afternoon schools in the entire city. There are like 50 of them. That means if a <clears throat> shul had after public school, Jewish boys came to a shul and they learned for an hour a day, for two hours a day after their public school. And it was called afternoon school. So under this United Hebrew Schools, they had 50 shuls that had afternoon schools. And now the problem was that some of these shuls were conservative and reform and orthodox. But the plus was that the United Hebrews had plenty of money and they were interested in getting like, you know, representing in the city of Detroit the afternoon schools and paying the teachers. And they had a plus, let's say an Orthodox school hired the teachers they wanted. The United Hebrew School never mixed into any of the chinuch issues. They were only paying the bill and they were able to say to the people of Detroit that we are sponsoring every single afternoon school in town. Now, Beis Yehuda was not part of the, the they, they had a big afternoon school with like three or 400, they had 300, 400 in the yeshiva, their day school. Then they had the afternoon school. <clears throat> and the United Hebrew was begging them, you're choking, you can't make a payroll in your school. Go under our umbrella. We're not mixing into what you teach. We're not telling you who to hire. So they brought to Detroit Ravaran Kotler, Rav Moshe Feinstein, and Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, who, like in the Litvisha world, were considered Zichronon Levrocha, the biggest Lomdim, Talmidei Chachamim, Poiskim, these three giants came to Detroit, and they came by train, and half the city went out to meet them at the train station. And they spent two days in Detroit. And they were in a hotel, and they invited the Balabatim one by one to come and spend 10 minutes, 15, with these three Rashi Yeshiva, these three Gedolim, and the president of the Yeshiva, what he felt, and what the Rashi Yeshiva Rav Box felt, and Rabbi Friedman, and Rabbi Goldstein, Zechron and Levracha, they had to say how they felt about Beis Yehuda joining the United Hebrew school system. And at the end of everything, and I, Baruch Hashem, have fond memories because I was only bar mitzvah around a month before. And this, in the city, the Rabbanim said they wanted me to lane for, it was a Monday morning, they brought him from the train station, it was Parshish Kiseitse. They gave <laughs> Rav Aaron Kotler the first aliyah, Rav Moshe Feinstein the second, and Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky the third. And I was the Balkoira, the little kid, just bar mitzvah for these three tzaddikim and, and gedolim. Um, 
And the end psak was that Rav Aaron Kotler Paskin, that they should not join the United Hebrew Schools. But Rav Moshe Feinstein and Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky held that they should join. And they did join because of our sedra, Achrei Rabim Lahatos, majority rules. Now, I want to share with you from the Gemara, in Bava Metzia, it tells a story of a Tanner Shel Achinoi. There was a very famous oven, a stove. And there was a question if the truma was touched by a sheretz or not. Where was the locale of the sheretz? That means an insect, which would be metama, and a koyen then could not eat the truma. And it was like a worldwide machloikis, a difference of opinion. On one side, you have Rebelozer Breb Herkinus, who held it was Tahar, and that you could eat, the Koyanim could eat the Truma. All the other Chachamim held it was Tome, and you had to burn it. Now, Rebelozer Breb Herkinus, you have to realize, says the Arizal, was the, all the shiv ka because they sold Yosef, had to be killed, and that's why there was the Asara Haruge Malchus. And over a 52-year span, these tzaddikim were one by one tortured and killed. And they went into hiding, Reb Shimon Bar Yochoi, and everyone was hiding from the Roman government. <clears throat> but there were some that they caught, and over the 52 years, they killed them. But there was one person walking the streets, <clears throat> excuse me, who was not hiding, and he was not bothered that they were looking for the tzaddikim, because they were not looking for him. They left him alone. Rebbe Lozer Bereb Herkinus. And the Arizal says, why was that? Because he was the neshama of Ruvain. And Ruvain, by the Mechiras Yosef, did not participate and was not even there. He was home by his father, Yaakov Avinu, because it was his day and his turn for Kibbut Av with his father. So Rebbe Lazar Reb Herkinus said that I feel very strongly that the truma is tar. And if I'm right, he said right outside the base of Medrash where they were all discussing this, there is a carob tree that was 400 years old. And it was gigantic with its roots seeped into the ground as mighty and as strong as a tree could be. So Rebbe Lazar Reb Herkinus said to his chaverim, to the other Tanoyim, if I am right, then that tree right outside the window of this base of Medrash should uproot on the spot and take off like a bullet. And that second, the Gemara says, that that tree uprooted itself and went flying like a mile away. But the Chachamim were not impressed. And they said, we still hold that the truma is Tomei. So then, Rebbe Lozer Breb Herkin is said that the koisle habayas, that means 
the walls of their base of Medrash should begin shaking. And it started like there was a tornado going on, the way the walls were done. And the Chacham said, no, we're still not yielding to you. So then Rebbe Lozer Berkin has said, do you see outside the window? There is a mountain and there's a stream coming down the mountain. And that stream that's coming down should go upward, which is a miracle. Streams don't go down, they go uh, up, they go down. And the stream suddenly stopped and started going upward. So then, and they still didn't accept. So then he said, Menashamayim yochichu. Let heaven prove and say something that I'm right. So there was suddenly a basco from Shamayim that called out and said to the Chachomim, what are you doing here? Rebbe Lozer Reb Herkins is the biggest of all of you and the halacha is like him. So they answered and said, Lo Torah, lo ba shamayim he. You don't paskin halacha in shamayim. Halachas have to be paskin down here, so we don't care that you're calling out that he's right in everything. So when that got done, they asked Rabbi Lozer Breb Herkness if he accepts their psak. And he said, no, I'm not. And they put him into Cherem. And many places in Shas, it says, Rebbe Lozer Breb Herkenes Shamutehu. He is excommunicated. He's in Cherem. And they went and they took the Kodshim, the, the Truma, the Chachomim, and they put it right into the oven and burnt it because they held it was Tomei and you had to burn it. So the Yerushalmi interestingly asks the Halo Yoda Rebbe Lezer She'achrei Rabim Lahatos didn't Rebbe Eliezer know that in Parshish Mishpatim Ar Sedra that it says you're supposed to go after majority and to talk and to discuss and debate was perfectly okay because you're allowed to prove your point. But after the whole discussion was over, why at that point he say, look, I still hold that it is Tahar, but I'm not the Rabbin. But he didn't say that. He never gave in. And that is the question of the Yerushalmi. Why didn't he at that point give in? And the, the Korban Eide at the bottom of the Yerushalmi answers, because Rabbi Eliezer held that Achrei Rabim Lahatos is a halocha in Dayonim. That means Dayonim, when someone's a judge, he doesn't just sit down because he's a Talmud Chochem. He has to know that each litigant is allowed to speak a certain amount of time. You can't have one guy, because he's the rich guy, speak for an hour. And the other guy, you give him five minutes. You can't have one standing and the other one sitting. There has to be equal treatment to everything. And that is because you have to be very sensitive. And Rabbi Eliezer held that after such a debate that there was a basco from Shemayim that I'm right. And that the tree uprooted itself and flew away. And everything that happened, you should at least been sensitive to me to at least let me leave the base of Medrash and then burn the Kodshim. But right in front of my face, you took it and you burnt it. You lacked in sensitivity, so you don't have a halacha of a dayan of achrei rabim lahatos, and therefore I did not have to listen to you to your majority rule. 
And that, says the Corbinate, is the reason that there was no response of Rabbi Eliezer, that he agreed and accepted the psak of all of the other Tanoim. From this story in the Gemara, which is such an eye-opener, do we see how sensitive and careful we have to be to somebody's feelings. And that goes through the day, and a person can't say, oh, well, I don't care. I don't like the guy's attitude, so I don't care if I was rough with him or I would. No one exempted anyone from how they treat another person under any circumstance, unless a person's a rusher. If someone's running down the street with a gun to kill people, you run outside and you kill him. I it says lo sirtzach. Yes, but there's a time that sometimes you have to take the law, so to speak, into your own hands. And speaking of that, I want to share with you another Gemara. And that is that Ravami, you know, if you go into the cemetery in Tveria where the Rambam and his father are buried off to the side, but in the regular cemetery, they're not with the Rambam. The Rambam's like 200 feet, 500 feet away. There are 10 tzaddikim buried there. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabbi Lozer, Rabbi Herkines, um, Ravami, Ravasi, the Shloha, ten of the biggest of the big in the world that lived in Olam Hazer. And Ravami is one of them. So Rav, the Gemara says that the nephew of Ravami came into Ravami, and Ravami was very sick, and he was about to be nifter. And his nephew saw he's sitting there and crying. So he's, there was a discussion. He said to his uncle, why are you crying? You think you didn't learn enough Torah? Look at the thousands of Talmidim who you taught Torah to. You don't think you did chesed? Look at all of those people that your chesed reached. So why should you be afraid to be nifter? That, that you're going to be in judgment. You, you're going up straight to the highest level of Gan Eden possible. So Ravami answered his nephew and he said, I am crying because there was one thing that I avoided in my lifetime, and that was to become a Dayan. My chaverim told me that you know, you're Roy, you're a Tana, you could be a Dayan, no question. But I felt that every time there's a Din Torah, people come out of the Din Torah, there's a winner and there's a loser. And even if there was a compromise, the compromise is usually tilted just to give something to the other litigant. But the main chunk of the success goes to one. And I didn't want to be with half of the world that they're looking at me, that I had a Din Torah with this one and with that one, and this one lost, so look how he looks at me. He barely says, Shalom Aleichem. I wanted to avoid that grief. I wanted to avoid it. So I never sat at a Besden. But through my life, I saw that there were friends of mine who did sit on the Besden, and yes, they paid a price that not everyone was happy with them, and not everyone, and they were not comfortable about it. But that was the price that they had to pay to be of service. But I was never of service because I didn't want to get caught up in the in the atmospheric negativity of Dayonim. But I did see that there was a lot of situations that the Dayan made the whole difference. How many of those broken hearts 
And how many of those people that were up to their neck in turmoil, how many of them could I, had I been a Dayan, influenced and brought some level of shalom, some level of peace of mind, and spoken to the litigants. And that's why I'm sitting here now and crying, and I'm about to be nifter. What do we learn from this discussion of Ravami with his nephew? Of course, many times the easy way out is to avoid this and to avoid that. Oh, they want me to be the chairman of the Malava Malka for the new mikveh. Oh, the mikveh is a fantastic idea. But what do I have to be part of a committee that this one's going to be quetching that he didn't get enough COVID? And that one's quetching that he should have been allowed to do this and that. And there's 10 complaints. What do I need it for? We are part of a society. And part of the society, unfortunately, is that in every grouping, there's someone who's a wise guy. There's somebody who is a cynic. There's somebody who is a skeptic. And we, we, with all the sarcasm and everything, but we can't put ourselves on the top of a mountain and seclude ourselves because we don't want to be bothered and we don't want to be swept in to that sea of dissent or that ocean of lush and horror. We have to work around and be the most positive influence that we can be in given situations and that's part of Olam Hazeh. That's what we learned from Ravami. He regretted that he did not become a Dayan to help uplift broken hearts and to be able to improve the atmosphere of the negative, bad-mouthing and everything that took place. Now, there is a vort from the Kotzker and the Chofetz Chaim. They both talk about this topic. In our pa Parsha, we have three topologies. Topology means double expression. That means when it talks about an Almon and a Yasum, an Almon and Yasum, the Torah in Chamisha Chumshe Torah, advocates for the almona and the yosom 15 times. That you should not afflict, and afflict doesn't mean to chas v'shalom hit or something like that, <coughs> but by what you even say. So the Pasuk in our parasha says, im ane sa'ane oso, if you afflict, and it's a double lotion, ane sa'ane, and then the Pasuk continues, Ki im tsa'ok yitzak, if the almana or the yasam, cry out to me, shamoa eshma. So there's three words that are repeated twice. So the Chavetz Chaim asks it, and the, the Kutzker spoke about it, because it could have just said, that if you afflict a yosem and he cries, I'll hear his crying. Just say one time each word. But the Chavetz Chaim explained that when somebody goes over to an almana or to a yosem, a child in a classroom, and he says to him something that he ends up crying, or the almana cries, explains the Chavetz Chaim that that almana is she's not just crying because of what the person said. She's crying because when she was hurt, it, she began to think, wait a second, this guy never would have said such a thing to me if my husband was still alive. So then you opened up the wound. She's crying because what you just said to her, 
and she's crying about the fact that the husband died that brings her back into that. So Kiim Tsaok Yitzak, that if he cry the Almoner the the Yasam excuse me, cry because of what was said now, there's one crying. But there's Yitzhak, there's the crime because they're reminded about the fact the boy says, if my father, they're looking at me like a Yosem, if my father was alive, they would never treat me like this. But they look at me like Nebuch the Yosem, the, the orphan. So there's a double crying. There's a crying for what just happened and it brings him back to the loss that he has suffered in his lifetime to all the tsaurus that he's encountering. Shamoa Eshma, I'm going to hear both cryings. Not just Shamoa that he's crying now, Eshma, I will hear the crying of that Yosem's heart, that he was hurt and that he was spoken to and he was treated so miserably. So, we see how the Torah goes way out to be able to refine our behavior in our speech and in our action, the difference that it could make in a case like it says, there's a machloikis whether a person's mazel can be changed. So one man, the Yomer, holds that you can never change your mazel. What you're born with, that's what you have. The other one holds you could change your mazel. There's a way to change your mazel. So the man, the Yomer, that holds you could never change your mazel, Toysus says in Moed Cotton, he also admits you could change your mazel one way. Even though he holds in general, you can't change your mazel. You could change your mazel by a mitzvah gedoyla. That's a, so the Mephoshim asks, what mitzvah gedoyla is he talking about? Tzedakah to almonos and yesoimen. That can make the difference that a person sees he has no muzzle, he has no children, he has no parnosada, he wants to change the muzzle. Let him start giving tzedakah to Yesoimim and Almon. It's a separate category. And that's what Toysus, the Mephorshim says, is referring to that if he starts doing a mitzvah gedoyla of tzedakah to Yesoimim and Almon, then he can change the trend, and he can change his mazel. Let's hope that we're zoicha to the beautiful mitzvahs in dealing with people and in dealing with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Let's take out the ego, which is in it, that we're proud of what we're doing. Somebody else is patting us on the back. Oh, you just did this and that. Uh, and the person's basking in the luster of the praise. Let's focus on just making our Kurdish Baruch Hu happy and the people that we are with, that they are happy to be around us because of shining character.